Okay, just to quickly review what we just talked about. If you have a spring that's at its relaxed position, that is, it's not applying any force, it's not stretched or compressed at all, um, and then you stretch it out, the force you need to apply to the spring to make it stretch uh, creates a straight line like this. Okay, for most springs in most situations. Obviously, if you overstretch the spring, you can break it, uh, and that's going to screw up this graph and, and all that. We're not talking about those kinds of situations. Everything here is good. The slope of this line is called your spring constant. And uh, so we get an equation for force as a function of our position x. Uh, the force as a function of x is equal to kx, where k is the slope of that line, and we call that slope the spring constant. Then we calculated the work underneath it by uh, just saying, hey, it's a triangle, so one half the base times the height. And we plugged this in for our uh, height. Kx is the height of the triangle. And we get one half kx squared. And this is the work it takes to stretch a spring from its relaxed position to some position uh, x. Um, and by the way, this will also uh, be true if you compress the spring as well as stretch it. Then we used a uh, little bit of calculus here. Uh, the work that we have to do to stretch a spring uh, is equal to the integral of the force times the displacement. And here we have our initial. We just went through all the, all the calculus to get this final equation right here. Okay, but let's take a look at it from the point of view of an object that's being pulled by the spring. So now we're going to take a, a different look at this. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. What if we've already stretched the spring? And here's a diagram you're going to see a lot. Here's some solid magical frictionless surface and we've got a spring anchored to it. Now if the spring wasn't stretched at all it would be right here. But we've stretched this guy out so that we've got a massive object right here that I'm holding. And then, boom, I'm going to release it. Let go of it. Obviously what's going to happen? Well you're going to have a net force due to this spring pulling it to the left. Notice that the direction of the force now is to the left. I had to apply a force to the right to get it there, but now the spring, the force applied by the spring to this massive object is to the left. So if I were to graph the force as a, uh, applied by the spring to this massive object as a function of its position, well here it's going to be some negative value. Why the negative? Why is the force negative? Because what does negative mean when you're talking about a vector? It means direction. The force is to the left, and we say that the left is the negative direction. And then as the massive object here gets closer and closer and closer to this zero, the force becomes less and less and less. And here we have that straight line again. Now, it's the same slope that we had before in this graph. It's the same slope, that is k, the spring constant, but now the force is negative instead of positive, so it's a negative slope. So this has a negative k slope. And we say that the force applied by the spring is equal to negative kx. The negative means that the, when, if the displacement or the, the, you know, our, our delta x is to the right, our position, I, I should say, is to the right, our force will be to the left. And vice versa is true too. If I compress the spring and scrunch it in so our object is over here, well, the force the spring applies to the massive object is to the right. So the force and the displacement have opposite sign, have opposite direction. This is, and I can go ahead and put vector hats on these because they are vectors. This is called 
Hooke's Law. After good old Robert Hooke, who discovered this many hundreds of years ago. So, now, what does the area underneath this graph represent? Well, this graph represents the work done by the spring to the massive object as it goes uh, to uh, as, it, as it moves in, in this direction. And so we can go ahead and uh, you know apply what we did before, the work done by the spring now. Now here's a subtle distinction. We're talking now about the work done by the spring. Before, we were talking about the work done on the spring by some outside agent. But now the spring is the outside agent that's applying a force to this massive object. So it's a, it's a, it's a subtle difference, but it is different. And so we have negative kx dx from x initial to x final. And uh, I'll spare you the algebra here. You can, you can go through uh, all of this, but what you get is you get one half k x initial squared minus one half k x final squared. I'll tell you what, pause the video right now and go through the math and you'll see that this is true. Okay? And so pause it right now and do it. Okay. Now unpause it. Hopefully you've unpaused it. <laughs> if you're hearing this, you have unpaused it. All right, and, and notice something that this is uh, just kind of the, the opposite of what we did here. here. Look at this equation we got before. Whoa. Um, in, in this equation, the work done to stretch a spring is, is x final minus, you know, x final squared minus x initial squared. But here, the work done by the spring is is this, and, and notice that this is going to be um, the, it's the negative of this. Okay, you, you, we've just switched sides here. Okay, so anyway, the work done by spring. So a, as the spring, you know, pulls this in, um, it, it's doing this much work, and so you have to uh, go through the computations and figure it out. So what I'd like you to do right now um, is uh, the next example problem on the homework on page 193 do example 6 and good luck.